become angry, how do you respond? Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Tolbert. Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, your online community of Christian education, teachers and students of the word. Thank you for joining us as we continue to explore the Word of God using the Precepts for Living commentary, which is based on the International Uniform Lesson Series. Remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new lessons. And teachers and serious students of the Word, you're invited to subscribe to PreceptsForLiving.com for complete lesson plans, videos, the word made simple and additional resources. <laughs> and when you subscribe, you'll have access to precepts on your tablet, phone, or laptop. So go to preceptsforliving.com and get those resources today. Each week, we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format. The text for you students of the word and teaching tips for those who you, of you who teach. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, the wisdom in today's lesson teaches us that sometimes we need to be silent. Help us, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna talk about that more in our lesson. <laughs> We're continuing our summer quarter entitled Wisdom, focusing on wisdom's many dimensions in Proverbs, the Gospel, and the Epistle of James. This final unit of lessons highlights some New Testament insights about wisdom from Bishop James. Today's lesson title is Hearing and Doing the Word, which challenges us to make our words and actions reflect our identity in Christ. Let's explore the text with our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will realize the proof of wisdom is not just in what we say, but also in what we do. Express compassion for those who are most vulnerable and desire to act on their behalf and engage in ministry that demonstrates the religion that James describes. Let's read our first set of verses from our scripture lesson in James. And I'm reading from chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 in the New Living Translation. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. What's important to know, and for those of you who are new to Sunday School Made Simple, we cover what's important to know, feel, and do, the cognitive, affective, and the psychomotor domains, as we say in Christian education. So, what's important to know from these two points that we just studied, from these two verses, excuse me, that we just read? <laughs> James advises us to be slow to speak and James advises us to be slow to become angry. Let's take a look at the background and context of these verses so we can better understand the scripture lesson for today. James, if you remember, he's the half-brother of Jesus, and he may have written this book before any of the books of the New Testament were written. In other words, James is one of the last books Although James is one of the last books in the New Testament, excuse me, it is one of the first books written for the New Testament. <sighs> James writes to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, which indicates initially that Jewish followers or converts identified with the regular Jewish population. They didn't distinguish themselves from other Jewish people. The brother of our Lord, is known as James the Just or James the Righteous. His goal was to help believers live godly lives during their domination by a perverse, pagan, self-indulgent Roman culture. The Romans persecuted the Jewish people and they needed to exercise wisdom in order to survive. 
Unfortunately, James was martyred in AD, or 62 AD, before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So we know that the book of James was written prior to his death. James begins verse 19 with practical instruction on wisdom from Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, as well as the teachings of Christ. His readers grew up reading and understanding and hearing the wisdom from Proverbs. So these wisdom sayings were passed down from generation to generation, and they were taught to, to Jewish children orally. Let me say that again, I get tongue twisted when I go so fast, I get excited. <laughs> so the Proverbs were taught to Jewish children orally, and so they learned these sayings. They were very, very familiar to them, but they were also deeply practical, these sayings, in this time when the church is undergoing such persecution. They're rejected, the gospel is spreading as the saints disperse, and James wants them to be wise. He revives the language and wisdom from the old culture of his day to usher in a new era, the reign of the kingdom of God. He takes the time to remind them that even though they are being persecuted and rejected, they should be patient, seek God for his wisdom, trust in him in the midst of their trials, and act honorably to best represent their faith in Christ. It would have been easy to be angry, presumptuous, prideful, and offensive because people rejected the gospel, so we don't need to listen to them. But James reminds them and us to live righteously and demonstrate self-control in the face of opposition. That godly behavior, or this godly behavior, will keep us out of unnecessary conflicts and also allow us to share the truth about the grace of Jesus Christ in both word and deed. The next set of verses from this lesson are from James chapter 1, and I'm reading verses 21 through 25, again, in the New Living Translation. So, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word of God. I'm sorry. And humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully, into the perfect law that sets you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. There are two key points from the verses we just read. We are to accept the word of God that has been planted in our hearts and we are to look into the perfect law that sets us free. <laughs> James illuminates an important lesson from Jesus himself that is the core of being a Christian or being in relationship with the Lord. We must not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, which Orthodox Jews still pray every day, it begins with, hear, O Israel. The word hear written in Deuteronomy 6, is the Hebrew word Shema, which means both listen and obey. Jesus ends many of his parables with the phrase, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. We must hear God's instruction and obey. It's one action. True wisdom for the believer is to understand and practice the word of God we can't separate our hearing and understanding what God has said from doing what God has said. Receiving the wisdom from God begins with understanding 
and doing his word. It was important for the early church leaders that Christians live counter to the culture to demonstrate the power of God in the earth. And it's important for us today too, wouldn't you say? This successful reflection of God's love and grace produces the fruit of the Spirit. To be doers of the word and not hearers only means that we put into practice the word of God which has been ingrained or carved in our hearts by reading and studying and learning the word of God. James says that if we are hearers of the word of God and not doers, we deceive our own selves. It's like looking into a mirror and not remembering what I look like. So imagine getting up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you you think you look fine. You haven't washed your face or brushed your teeth or combed your hair and you go out into the world. Oh my goodness, that person has forgotten what they look like when they look into the mirror. And in those days, mirrors were very dull. They weren't clear like our mirrors. They were made, they had like a metallic surface. So when they looked into the mirror, they really didn't see clearly. However, James says that when we look into the perfect law of liberty, we look into God's word, we will see ourselves clearly. And if we look into God's word and then we don't do what it says, we deceive ourselves. Deceive means that we are tricked or we fool ourselves into thinking we're something when we're not. God's word tells us what it means to be a Christian and what a Christian should look like. We should see our reflection in the word of God. If we don't look like God's word, something's wrong. Amen? (laughs) Let's read our next set of verses. These are the final for this lesson from James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. I'm getting my precepts. And again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Beautiful, beautiful verses. James 1.27. Oh my goodness, that's the verse so many of us use in orphan care ministry. So there are two key points from these, this portion of scripture that we just read. True religion results in disciplined speech and true religion results in compassionate action. James clarifies what genuine or true religion looks like. And this is one of the few times in the New Testament that the word religion is used. And it's interpreted and explained. James gives us a key. What does it mean? For his readers, James reinforces that true religion is practiced in both word and deed, what we say and what we do. But it's not good enough to say we're religious and then say, whatever mean, lying, gossiping, offensive, perverse, or crude thing we want to say. The deed must line up with the words we speak. And the evidence of good words is controlling the tongue. (laughs) This means we need to watch what we say. True religion results in disciplined speech, an aspect of the fruit of the spirit is self-control, and there are nine aspects of one fruit of the Spirit. That's in Galatians, yes? So, genuine or true religion in action is not just outward actions of piety. Let me say that again. Genuine or true religion is not just about how we look on the outside, these actions of piety or looking religious. You know, we go to church and we put on our religious attitude and our religious words and all of that. It's easy to look holy while other people are watching us. But true religion is about caring for the most vulnerable among us, the widows and the orphans. In our society today, we understand that orphans are vulnerable, but how 
that orphans are vulnerable. <laughs> but how often do we think about the widows? In the first century Jewish culture, the, in the middle of the Roman Empire, women did not have their own wealth and they were not able to sustain themselves. They were very, very vulnerable if they were a widow. In many cases, they didn't own property and they could not advocate for themselves in various social, political, or religious spheres. So James writes this and it complements the law of the covenant, which several times talks about how the Jews are to take care of widows and orphans. This mandate was reinforced by the prophets and James continues the same idea and makes it plain that in light of this Christianity, since Christ has come, the concern and the emphasis and the focus is the same. So as believers, we are called to be doers of the word, not just hearers, people who behave in accordance with the principles we read in the Bible. We act and talk in a way that is consistent with Christ because we reflect him in our lives. Amen? That means that we look after the widows. We take care of the orphans. And the orphans in our modern day are the children living in foster care. Well, that's what's important to know. What's important to feel? It's important to feel compassion for those who are most in need. There are so many vulnerable, vulnerable, I keep tripping up over that word, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there are so many vulnerable people in our society today and throughout the world. Rather than ignore them or condemn them or you know, just feel indifferent, we must feel compassion whether they're homeless, poor, orphaned, or trying to adjust to life after the loss of a loved one. We're called as followers of Jesus Christ to show compassion, respond to them as Jesus did. He responded to everybody who came to him for help, and we should do the same. And we should think in advance, what might they need? Let's pray for them and consider what their needs might be and respond to those needs without even being asked. Oh my goodness, that's what God wants us to do. Let's stand up for the weak, for the sick, for the hungry, for the homeless, for the alien. Remember that Jesus even cried when those who are mourning over Lazarus dying, they came to him and when he went there, Jesus cried with them. Jesus wept and then he did something about it. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, that's what's important to feel. What should we do in response to today's lesson? We should do what the word of God says. It doesn't get any more simple than that. We should be hearers and doers of the word. When the word tells us to care for the vulnerable, we should do that. When the word says love God with our whole heart, we should do that. When it says to love God with our mind and our strength, let's do that. When the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself, let's do that. And when the Bible says that we should not engage in sex outside of marriage, we should obey. When the Bible says don't lie or steal or kill, we should obey. There should not be a distance between our hearing and our doing. Wisdom is not just simply knowing what the Bible says and then doing what we want. As Jesus pointed out, even the Pharisees do that. Instead, when people see us, we should look like Jesus to them. We should be known by how we love one another because Christ loves us. People in the world need to see the love of God through us. Simply hearing us say one thing and then acting differently, it doesn't let them know the love of God. And we serve him and represent him. And Christians, this is a word. Those who have ears to hear, let him hear.
that's our lesson for today. Now, let's talk about how to teach this lesson. Remember to pray. Don't forget to pray that your students will have receptive hearts and minds to be obedient to God's word, and that you'll be creative and use a variety of methods, especially in this digital world, <laughs> to help our students understand, to help your students understand rather, and pray that your students will apply what they've learned to their lives. Don't forget to pray for wisdom. Now, hook or open this lesson. If you're still sheltering in or teaching digitally, you can hook your students by asking a question. I know you won't be able to hear their answer, but you still want them to think with you. And one of the questions that might be good to ask is, what is one word of wisdom you'll never forget? In other words, someone gave you a word of wisdom or some advice and it lasted you all this time, what was that? So have them share, discuss that. Or download the In Focus video from preceptsforliving.com and answer the question at the end of the video, which is, how do we put anger in its proper place? Oh my goodness, what a good question for all that we're going on these days, going through these days. For those of you who teach children, ask them, how do you respond when a brother or sister makes you angry? Or what do you do if your mom or grandmom says something that makes you angry? That'll be good. And, and don't judge the little ones. Don't, you know, kind of berate them if they say something that's not really the response we want. We just want to hear the responses and then kind of guide them to help them manage their anger. And then transition into book or present the scriptures. Invite volunteers to read the entire portion of scriptures and ask them what stood out to you or resonated with you from these verses. And then read the in-depth paragraphs which explain the scriptures. And now you're ready to transition into look or explore the meaning. Answer the questions in the lesson. There are so many questions in in-depth, search the scriptures, discuss the meaning. Those are portions of the precepts for living that those paragraph titles. And so read that teacher, study that in advance and select a question that you feel is right for your students. One of those great questions from the lesson is this, how would James evaluate the body of Christ today? Oh my goodness. What would he say about how we treat widows and orphans? And then transition into took or next step for application. Read liberating lesson, or if you have a student that can, everyone can hear, ask them to read liberating lesson. And then for application, for activation, ask each person to read that silently and write down in their journal what they hear the Holy Spirit saying to them today. And end your class in prayer very special lesson as we cope with sheltering in for those of you who are still sheltering in and uh, being enclosed and in tight quarters and having limited mobility. Oh my goodness, we must learn how to say wise words and control our emotions, yes? Such a good lesson. God bless you as you teach. And now, let's talk mailbag. And Joining us for Mailbag is Minister Alan Reynolds, our millennial theologian. He's filled with so much wisdom. He's a scholar, a husband, a father. Oh my goodness, we are just so grateful for all that he brings. And thank you for your comments and encouraging words to him on Sunday School Made Simple. So, Minister Alan, in the King James Version, James says to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Would you explain what that means in our modern day context? Sure. So uh, he's making this point about true religion. And again, this is contrasted uh, against what the Pharisees were doing, right? Um, at the time that James is writing, the uh, new church, remember, it has only been around for maybe 20 or 30 years at this point, And they're trying to figure out how to be uh, followers of Jesus, they actually still considered themselves Jews, and, and James himself is Jewish. We know that all of the apostles were Jewish, 
and uh, they haven't differentiated yet. They, they don't see themselves as some separate Christianity. They're just Jews who follow Jesus at this point. And so there are other people at the time who are teaching that, oh, you know, you need to keep the Jewish uh, kosher laws or, you know, uh, fast a certain way or, you know, do these certain things in order to remain followers of Jesus. And James is trying to make this point, uh, as we read about in the book of Acts at the Council of Jerusalem, that all of those things that you needed to do to be Jewish, you don't need to be a Gentile Christian, right? Uh, and that instead, Jesus has invited us into something so much bigger and not just focused on keeping little laws or, or being super pious according to keeping the law perfectly the way that the Pharisees understood it. And so he wants instead people to recognize that they should have true religion. It's not about, you know, outward signs of piety, praying on the corner or having the longest tassels on your robe or, you know, those sorts of things that the Pharisees did, but instead is about caring for the widow and orphan, right, which is part of God's law, which if we were going to tie back to Ten Commandments again, you know, I always do that because it just is so core to the Jewish understanding of things that that caring for neighbor is going to be caring for the most vulnerable, especially, uh, but then the other part of that is that piety towards God, that loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, or our heart, our heart, whole heart, mind, and strength, is to keep ourselves unspotted from the world, or as the New Living Translation says, um, to keep oneself, you know, separate, right? Um, that we're not supposed to be like the pagans, right? So those are the two extremes. Uh, we don't want to be involved with all of the perversion that they have in Roman culture. We don't want to be involved with the violence of the Roman culture. Remember, they have uh, gladiator fights. They have these chariot races where people are being killed. They're what, like, you know, that's just part of the culture. Um, and James wants Christians, these followers of Jesus, to remember they don't want to be like that. They don't want to be like the Greek philosophers who are, you know, making excuses to do whatever they want the Romans who were just indulging in whatever feels right at the time, or like the Pharisees who were saying you have to do X, Y, Z in order to prove that, you know, you're part of the in crowd and really following God. And so it's those extremes that James is pushing back against and saying that this is what it's really about, love for God and love for neighbor, seen as taking care of the widow and orphan in love for neighbor and making sure that you're devoting the way that you live to God and not to yourself into a, a perverse culture. Well, that's excellent, thorough. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for expanding on that and illuminating, you just brought life and context to that. Thank you so much. And I know that our viewers have gained more wisdom. They're ready to teach and do the word of God. Why won't you read, why don't you read for us um, our keep in mind verse sure and today's keep in mind verse it comes um, from james chapter 1 verse 22 22 excuse me i'm scrolling in my precepts online here and in the new living translation it says but don't just listen to god you must do what it says Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. And that's James 1.22. Well, what a word for the wise. Those who have ears to hear, hear what the Lord is saying. You have a blessed week. <laughs>